Good morning, everyone, and um, happy Wednesday. And it's so fantastic to see so many of my colleagues from Amazon, but also from open source program offices across the industry. My name is Nithya Ruff, and I lead the Amazon open source program office. I always say Amazon, not AWS, because uh, my team and I support all of Amazon. The AWS site, which is very systems and technology provider side. And then the SDO side, which is stores, devices, other, which covers you know all of the other businesses, which really support us, uh, stores being the main one. And then devices like Alexa, Fire TV, that sort of thing. And then other being you know Prime Video, Prime Music, uh, Ring, lots of other uh, areas. And, um, there's so many OSPOs today in different industries, and also OSPOs have changed over the years. And lots of challenges and opportunities that all of us have faced you know, over the past five, six years. I would say pandemic, during pandemic, post-pandemic, uh, economic uh, cycles, and uh, all of this reminded me to go back and take a deep, deep look at what are the requirements for running a successful OSPO. And in so doing, I also checked in with a bunch of you and a bunch of my colleagues and said, you know, what works, what doesn't work for you. Um, just to give you a little bit of my background, I've been doing open source in one way or the other for the last 25 years. And I've run three OSPOs over the last 10 years, uh, starting with uh, SanDisk, Western Digital, which was a very semiconductor kind of OSPO and then moved on to Comcast, which is much more of an enterprise OSPO, media and technology, and the use of tech open source in media and technology. And then uh, most recently, I just finished my second year at Amazon, um, running the Amazon OSPO. So let me go into the agenda and what we will cover today. So what you see in this picture, if you haven't had a chance to see the spheres, I would suggest you go check it out. It's on the Amazon campus on 7th Avenue and is an iconic downtown Seattle must-see. It is home to about 40,000 plants from around the world and a space for Amazonians to find inspiration to work. Uh, the public can view it on the weekends, uh, but there's also a fantastic uh, speakeasy bar called Deep Dive uh, underneath the spheres that you may want to check out. Um, so, yes. Sh shameless plug, it's part of the walking tour that's available through the conference tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. Yes. So go, go take care of, and the days are sunny and beautiful here in uh, Seattle right now. A uh, couple of th things that we'll cover today, just a brief history of OSPOs, right? Just to kind of see where we came from, what was the reason OSPOs got started, what did they do? And then, what are some of the changes that happened in these last few years? Um, and what matters to running a successful OSPO today? And, and turning to audience questions and answers. We have 40 minutes, I'll do 30 minutes, and then we can uh, go to audience questions and answers. Okay. Um, I don't have to say this, but open source is everywhere. Uh, there are two elements I associate with open source. One is the licenses themselves, which makes it a very unique um, way to work. It gives us the freedom to examine, use, modify, distribute, and it's developed with collaboration across the world. Those are the two really critical elements of what makes open source open source. And as companies started using more and more open source, started shipping products with open source, the notion of an open source program office in an enterprise or in an organization came into being so that these groups of experts in a company can help the company navigate open source communities, but also um, up-level you know, the education of people inside the company on processes, policies, how to work with open source, et cetera. Um, a history of OSPOs. So in the 1990s, I, I was working at Silicon Graphics, and companies like SGI, Sun, IBM, HP, Intel would have something called an open source strategy office or 
At Intel, it was the Open Technology Group, OTG. And these groups were trying to figure out how to work with open source. Uh, they would work with the product divisions on the strategy for use of open source and product shipped. Um, that was the time when IBM invested millions of dollars in open source, started the Eclipse Foundation, and a lot of foundations were started during that time, you know, Linux Foundation, Apache, etc. I don't know why it's flickering, um, but bear with me. And then it wasn't until 2014 uh, that a bunch of companies like Microsoft, Facebook, Twitter, Google, started a back channel across OSPOs or open source offices called the To-Do Group. Talk openly, develop openly, or do openly, I think. And they meant it to be you know, a sharing supportive group to say, hey, what are you doing? Are you encountering this issue? How are you tackling this? Uh, how are you working on this? So it was meant to be a support group. And finally, in 2016, the to-do group became a part of the Linux Foundation and became more of an open group where anybody who was a member of the LF could join the to-do group as well. And they started doing a good job of you know, capturing case studies and uh, best practices and really creating a, a collaboration point for companies and academia, public sector to collaborate on OSPOs. I often say OSPOs are kind of your gateway to engaging across the ecosystem. I know who to call in Meta or Microsoft or uh, Indeed or other companies and say, hey, uh, can I talk to you about working with you or what are you doing in this area? So it's become a, a really good way to collaborate across the industry and frankly, academia and public sector. Public sectors are starting OSPOs as well. United Nations, um, let's see, the city of Paris, um, and countries are starting OSPOs, so it's, it's a good thing. But there were a lot of changes, uh, to be honest, you know, during the pandemic and post-pandemic. Uh, on the left-hand side, in, you know, where the grass is green, <laughs> The good news is there were a lot more public sector OSPOs, so that's a good thing. Uh, because public sector was a hard thing to crack, not to crack, to understand how do you engage with EU, how do you engage with CISA, CISO, and NIST, and you know, the US government, etc. So that was a good thing. The increased scope of some of the OSPOs was a good thing. I think OSPOs took on more things to do. Uh, universities, more universities, OSPOs were funded, like uh, UC Santa Cruz, Carnegie Mellon, Johns Hopkins, uh, lots of great OSPOs were funded. I think Ford Foundation was, was writing uh, checks to fund that. And, and RIT, and, and a lot of these universities, uh, their objective is not just open source, it's open uh, innovation, open science, open data, so they are encouraging their academia, uh, academic, you know, professors and others to publish research more openly, share more openly, um, rather than put it behind a paywall. So a lot of good things happening there. On the flip side, uh, sadly, some OSPOs went away. Either the companies didn't see value in those OSPOs or something changed, you know, in, in the economics and they went away. Some shrank, some got distributed. Uh, so instead of you know a, a kind of a single collective of say technologists, compliance, GitHub, you know lots of different functions, they got split into the GitHub group went and lived with maybe the central GitHub team, um, the compliance team went and lived with the central tooling team, and the OSPO became kind of more of a small focus group of program managers perhaps. And so that, that was uh, something that, that I saw happening. And sometimes OSPOs just moved into the security function, for example, because security was taking front stage and center, you know, open source security and regulations, et cetera. So the OSPO became a part more of the security team. So the question becomes, what does it take to run a successful OSPO and how can OSPOs continue to be strong, relevant, and you know, supportive of their companies and their mission? 
I think the number one factor, one of the factors, and I, it's n in no particular order, the first factor I chose to talk about is where you sit in an organization matters for OSPOs. So some of the better locations in talking to some of my uh, peers in the industry is working for the CTO, because a CTO typically has central technology strategy and is more of a central function that kind of talks about policy process, consistency, and practices across the company. That's a good place. Um, the chief operating officer, uh, COO, is good because you have both strategy and operations in a COO function. And OSP, good OSPOs know how to take policy and operationalize it in the company's uh, practices so that it becomes a default practice in the company rather than a standalone you know, uh, practice. Head of engineering is another good place because a lot of what we do in OSPOs is work with developers and enable developers to use open source without friction, successfully engage with external parties, deal with risks like comp compliance, et cetera. So I think that those are all uh, things that make sense. And something called platform engineering, which is usually a central group in a company that provides technology, tooling, uh, and practices for developers and builders across the company. And we in Amazon, we live in our Amazon Software Builder Experience Organization, which is kind of a central tooling and infrastructure group for all of our builders across the company. Less common are marketing, <coughs> and, and we have a marketing group too in Amazon. We felt that it was good to have both inside the infrastructure side and in the marketing side. Um, and we are very purists in terms of how we do roles in Amazon, so it didn't make sense for a single OSPO with marketing and engineering all mixed together. So marketing lives in marketing, and they get a lot of benefits of that. And then we live in, inside the company from an engineering perspective. But pure play marketing may not work because it may be not tied to strategy or not tied to operations, not tied to engineering, uh, or what's happening in terms of real world use of open source in the company. Legal, I think, is also not a good place. Um, legal tends to be risk averse, and uh, an OSPO needs to be broader than just taking you know, what risk is. It needs to take into account community norms, practices, business needs, and really advocate for the builder and the developer uh, past legal risk. But, but you need to work very closely with legal, clearly. Security is another good place, and it's not a bad place, but again, security, the muscles in security have been to work inside the company and in a very secretive way and not in an open and collaborative way. So sometimes there's a tension between security and open, and so that may be not a very uh, good place to be. There are some distributed and virtual OSPOs. I think Netflix used to have a, a very distributed OSPO where there were members from across the business who did some OSPO functions and then came together periodically and exchanged ideas and established consistent norms, et cetera. So I, my, my personal preference, frankly, is you know on the left side, uh, being closer to engineering, being closer to technology strategy in a central place, I think is, is a good place. Let's look at the second factor I think that's important for success. You really need someone in the company at the senior uh, level who is your sponsor, who believes that open source is important to the company uh, and who backs it, who goes to bat for you, who advocates for you, um, and who cares about the success of an OSPO. But at the same time, um, I, I don't think you should rely just on your executive sponsor because sponsors change and sponsors' missions change. And some of the OSPOs who went away in the last two years say to me that some of their problem was that the person who brought them in and believed in, in them went away. And the next sponsor or the next person who led that organization really didn't believe in what they did. 
and didn't support it and didn't you know, help them. So you really need to build broad support across the company and we'll talk more about stakeholders and customers and how building support is important. Uh, you can't just rely on one person. Business alignment, impact, and language, I think, are the next uh, the key element I would talk about. And this one is the Mont Lake Bridge connecting Lake Union to Lake Washington. I don't know if it's part of the tour, Jeff, but uh, it's, it's a lovely, lovely bridge. And I wanted to use it to show that we are bridge builders as OSPOs. We build bridges from company to community, community to company. Uh, we are ombudsmen for, for the organization we work in. Uh, so we are the first ones people will contact if there's a compliance issue, if there's a community issue, if they want sponsorship, or to know how to navigate the company. Who do I work with at Amazon you know, that is in the media side? Or how can we you know, uh, work with you guys? So it's important for us to be visible and bridge, bridge builders. The second thing we are are translators. Uh, there's a very different language in open source and in business. So you need to be able to translate back and forth between the two languages and know who your audience is. So if I'm talking to an executive at Amazon, I need to talk in terms of elements that matter to them and business metrics and business impact that matter to them, and not talk in terms of uh, softer benefits, like, um, you know, it's good for the community, or uh, it's a good thing. And my boss at Comcast would say, soft benefits are good. I'm glad they come along. But we need hard benefits which show why we need to invest, why we need to do what we need to do and you need to be able to speak both languages. And business alignment to me is understanding, you know, how do we use open source in this company? Where is it used? What are the top packages we use? What are the customer needs? Um, are customers telling us how we should engage in open source or which open source packages matter to them or what services matter to them? What are our critical dependencies? How should we and which community should we engage with? It should really be driven by the company strategy and how open source fits into that strategy. For us, we use it in infrastructure. We use it in devices. We use it uh, in building our managed services on the AWS side. We also provide managed open source services like Elastic uh, Kubernetes service, or DB2 based on Postgres or MariaDB. So there are services products, there are infrastructure products, there are you know, devices we ship to customers. So all of that we need to understand and the role of open source in each of those different businesses and how to help that business both mitigate its risks but also take advantage of the opportunities uh, in that business and which ecosystems they need to work with. So, you know, for, from a focus and measurement of impact of the OSPO, we need to look at are we reducing the friction for use? Are we adding mechanisms for businesses to manage their critical dependencies and engaging with the communities that they need to engage with? And are we sharing uh, these impact metrics with the right stakeholders? Um, and we'll talk more about stakeholders. We already talked about communications and business language. Um, at Amazon, uh, we have a number of different mechanisms for communicating impact and value. And I'm sure in your companies, you have them and you need to find them. Uh, we do you know, monthly business reviews inside the team. Uh, we do quarterly business reviews with our executives and stakeholders. We recently started doing uh, customer advisory boards to connect with our customers. And we are doing some newsletters um, so that we can communicate what we do and new policies and processes that we are doing. And that becomes so important so that there's a broad understanding across the organization of the value that you bring and, and the, the problems you solve. And, and we need to constantly inspect our work. And every year, 
make sure that we are working on the right things. We are working with the right teams across the company. Are we also giving back enough to open source? Uh, and are we working with the right communities? Uh, are we aware of trends in open source so that we can bring those back uh, to the company and help guide the company in uh, which projects to join, which communities to work with, how to avoid license changes or other risks that are happening in the community. This was meant to you know, really articulate the same thing, where and how we use open source, what do our customers care about, are we doing enough to sustain open source, because we all depend upon this commons, and if that commons does not exist, then our success is, is not there as well, cannot be assured. How do I measure business impact? Um, what are some of the areas we impact the business? Uh, cost reductions, helping with business continuity, you know, making sure upstream is successful so that the products and services you build based on that are also successful. Um, in some companies, uh, when I was at Comcast, recruitment was a big thing. The reason we participated in open source was because it helped us establish a technical brand as a company and recruit people. Uh, they could actually see the work we did. Um, and then lastly, how do we communicate this impact? Are we doing a good job? Recently, my team and I were inspecting the mechanisms we have, and we said, are there any gaps? Uh, are we not connecting with certain parts of the company? Or is there a gap in how we communicate you know, what we do? So number four is really the stakeholder and customer and collaborating with them. At the end of the day, you know, as I said, the, the executive sponsor is important, but she or he is just one person, and you really need to build a broad base of support across the company and a broad acknowledgement that what you're doing is valuable and useful you want people across the company speaking for you and saying, gosh, I, I'm so glad the, the OSPO was at the table because they helped us navigate this very difficult situation. Or when they're writing a strategy document, they should say, I want the OSPO to be one of the first reviewers of this document so we have a sound idea of how we want to do the open source strategy for this product. And when they write a new product requirements document, which we call PRFAQ, they should be saying, what is my open source investment? What is my open source strategy? Who do I need to work with? Which ecosystems do I need to work with? So those questions really need to be in the mechanisms across the company. To me, um, there's the internal stakeholders, and then there's the external stakeholders and customers we work with. So inside the company, you have sponsors, which we talked about, keeping your sponsor up to date and making sure you're communicating your value there. And then uh, to the bottom, you have legal, security, policy, like public policy and corporate development are some of the stakeholders, including HR, by the way, advocating for open source talent inside the company is another job we do. And then on the left-hand side and the right-hand side are customers. Um, for us at Amazon, developers are our customers, and we call them builders. And then developers' managers become an important customer too, and business owners. We often find that the developer is doing a lot of good open source work, but their managers don't know, understand the value of it, nor do they support them in doing this work or make time for them to do this work. And they often think that they are taking time away from you know, company work to do open source work when open source work is important to the success of the company work. So un talking to engineering managers is just as important. And then on the external side, OSPOs work with foundations. So a lot of us manage relationships with uh, whichever foundations we are members of, right? Like the Linux Foundation or Apache or Eclipse. And that needs to align with clearly uh, the ecosystems that you need to work with. Uh, and for cloud native, for me, it's CNCF. Uh, for IoT and embedded, it may be Eclipse. 
Apache has a broad set of projects across lots of different areas, especially data. So that may be a foundation that I need to work with from a data perspective. And projects, sometimes you have to work directly with certain projects uh, because they are independent and they're not you know, part of a foundation. More and more we are working with policymakers, um, NIST, CISA, um, EU, Open Europe Alliance uh, Forum, rather, um, the United Nations, OSPOS for Good, et cetera, because public policy has become extremely important in open source in the last few years, right, with executive orders and regulations and things like that. We no longer can hide under a rock as open source. We are wide open. Uh, from a security perspective, from an AI perspective, people want to know that open source supply chains can be trusted. So understanding what regulations mean for the company and how to provide input into the regulation process becomes an important part of what we do as an OSPO. And research in academia. Um, I work very closely with RIT and UC Santa Cruz, uh, but Research in academia, um, Harvard has been, Harvard Business Review and Frank Nagel has been doing really good work in uh, measuring open source impact and other topics at the intersection of open and business. And so working with academia becomes important, influencing research, maybe collaborating uh, with academia. The next key statement I would say, the fifth one is you need to continue to be relevant as an OSPO and you need to evolve with both changes in the market as well as your own business uh, evolution. And that is where I think a lot of us sometimes could go wrong if we stick to this is what an OSPO does, this is all we do, we are, we are purists, we're not gonna change and not pay attention to the tea leaves around you, the changes that are happening, um, you can become extinct. And I feel you need to uh, evolve constantly and check priorities of your OSPO. Business needs keep changing every year. And for us, uh, a process that we use is OP1, uh, which is our planning process. So we kind of uh, look at what the business is saying they need. Uh, I'm sure for a lot of companies, AI is becoming an important you know, driver. Um, Security is becoming an important driver. Policy is becoming an important driver. So you really need to understand what your business needs from the OSPO. And second is, um, where are you in the maturity curve of the OSPO? And we'll talk about that and keep moving up the maturity curve. And frankly, not all business units in your company need to move up the secure maturity curve. Some businesses may always be just consumers and some businesses may be highly engaged with upstream and downstream because it's an important element of their open source strategy. And so understanding who to push and who not to push from an open source maturity perspective is important. And then the open source landscape itself is changing constantly. Uh, the social engineering aspects of XZ, what does that mean? Uh, license changes that have happened in, with Ahashikor and Redis, and what does that mean? How do you prepare for that? Um, whether you're an enterprise or a technology provider, it impacts you. So the maturity curve of an OSPO, you've all seen this. I think this is part of the to-do group's maturity stages of OSPOs. At the earliest stage, you know, all of us consume uh, open source, and then we start putting you know, more legal policies and processes in place. We start communicating across the company, uh, educating, and sometimes community engagement comes a little later when uh, teams realize that forking and technical debt are not good, they need to upstream changes, they need to contribute back, and then they start realizing, I need to have a more consistent presence in the communities I care about. I cannot just come in and come out whenever I want to. And then you start getting into releasing open source and becoming a, a thought leader in open source. And different businesses, as I said, in your company may need different stages of this. For us, AWS is at the highest levels. You know, it's very strategic, so we uh, are very outward facing. 
We're also uh, working with upstream communities. We also release open source. Uh, we're very engaged on that side. On the SDO side, it's much more of a consumer of open source and then complying with open source distribution, um, you know, licenses or, or attributions. Um, we would like to, though, encourage them to do more upstreaming because technical debt is not good for anyone and building those muscles are good um, and we need to do more in certain projects where we are very dependent upon that project. So we do need to do more in that area. So that's one of the focus areas for us this year is how do we push our devices teams, how do we push our stores teams to do more in, in the open source area. And then when you look at the changing open source landscape, I think we've touched on a lot of this before. Security is front and center. So what's the role of open source program office in security? When you have a security team, you have infrastructure teams who are building you know, uh, the secure supply chain elements into your infrastructure, what is the role of a, uh, the open source program office? We've come to the conclusion that we need to be very much present. Sorry about that. We need to be very much present in directing that activity and connecting the dots across all the different players in the company who are working in secure supply chain. And very often, we get involved on the policy side and the upstream side, like OpenSSF and Alpha Omega and then bring that knowledge into the security team, into our secure supply chain team. Uh, and it's important that we play that role because there are nuances to working in open source that security may not get and our infrastructure teams may not get and policy teams may not get. So we need to advocate for open source, advocate for open source inside the company and act as brokers with foundations and projects on CV, you know, uh, publishing, how we exchange security information, and so on and so forth. AI is becoming really, really important, and I think there's a role for OSPOS to play in AI. We're playing two different roles. One is working with external organizations like LFAI and Data, PyTorch Foundation, also OSI, uh, to make sure that there is a solid definition of what open in AI means. I think you've heard a lot about the fact that AI has so many elements, it's not just code. And so the legal constructs and how you declare something open in AI is very different. So we are making sure that we are heard there. And the other side, we are helping our IP legal team to scale uh, what they need to do inside the company. You know, I, as you can imagine, there's overwhelming demand inside companies for uh, use of models, use of data sets by developers, or to publish something, or uh, to you work with Hugging Face. And the policy is evolving so fast, and, and so you, legal cannot keep up sometimes with these things. So wherever the risk is well known or low, uh, we want to start kind of helping IP legal review those cases for approval uh, and thereby scaling. And it's a muscle that OSPOs have already because we've been helping with license reviews for a long time. So it's really an extension of that muscle into AI. And the last one is we used to believe that we were police and gatekeepers and, you know, naysayers and, uh, you know, and, and, we didn't believe in uh, frictionless open source. <laughs> we introduced friction sometimes as an OSPO in the old days. And so for me, developer experience is becoming so critical. So you want to make it as easy as possible for developers across the company to use open source and not really become a naysayer, a gatekeeper, but more a guide, build that into default systems, automate, simplify policies and processes. If it's low risk, make it you know, uh, auto-resolve rather than manual intervention. Um, so we work hard to balance that developer experience with risk mitigation and uh, risk management. 
So why do we invest in open source? I think you've probably heard from a bunch of us. Uh, listen, <laughs> we are built on open source. Uh, Amazon would not exist without open source. Uh, we depend upon it across the company. And our customers want us to build open source services. And so uh, it's important for us to do that. And the world depends upon open source. And we have to sustain it as all of us as consumers of open source, we need to participate and play a role in supporting it. And in the OSPO itself, uh, we do risk mitigation, not just of license, but of reputation, business continuity, security. Uh, we work with legal on policies and guidelines for open source use. Uh, we reduce friction, as I said, from a developer uh, experience perspective. And we mo role model, but we also encourage um, our teams to participate and support uh, communities and foundations. And we really need to measure, uh, communicate, and make adjustments as needed. And our customers, as I said, uh, software builders, builder managers, uh, product managers also. It's important that the business be involved. And some of the partners we work with, uh, legal, marketing, uh, the tools teams, infrastructure teams, security, policy, uh, corporate development, and HR. With that, I wanted to turn it over to you all and see if you had any questions. Hey, Jeff. The question is, um, why has Amazon changed over the last 15 years? And how has the culture changed? What has helped change this culture? culture? Uh, I take no credit. The OSPO was started in 2007. And there has been a group of people like Henry Yondel and others who have been nudging, 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 you know, changing the culture little by little by little across all these years. And then in 2017, the marketing and strategy team uh, under Adrian Cockcraft and others, now David Nelly, have been also doing a lot of uh, work. I think what's changed is all of these years of uh, hard work by a lot of people across the company to uh, keep being more open and build some of the uh, open source work into our default mechanisms, whether it's into our product strategy documents or business continuity documents or uh, our infrastructure system so it automatically gets screened. All of that, I think, makes sense. You've got to build it into the mechanisms that your companies rely on. You can't rely on just people to change culture. You, it has to be in the uh, traditions and practices of the company. So I think all of that uh, has changed uh, and helped, yeah. Yes. Markets and how, you know, it is important to integrate or to work with those. And I wonder if you can share how uh, Amazon is going about you know, policy, maybe some, you know, what is the process in terms of monitoring, identifying what's important, and then adapting in terms of, let's say, anything that would maybe um, uh, be relevant for your OSS compliance or um, 
uh, participation in the ecosystem or contributions, et cetera. So I'm, I'm interested in hearing how the processes are internally. Thanks. So how do you stay in tune with what's happening and then adapt as you learn? Mm -hmm. um, a big part of it has been uh, being members of different organizations like Apache and LF, attending events, um, being part of you know working groups and forums like OpenSSF's working group or chaos or to-do group because you really learn so much from each other. And then bringing it back and we have a bunch of Slack channels we use to share information with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have a strategy meeting every Thursday where a lot of open source folks across the company get together and say, what do we need to do with this change that's happening? Uh, how do we adapt to that? Or there's an RFI for information uh, or for feedback on this particular regulation. How do we want to respond back? So we've been trying to coordinate uh, responses and, and collectively bring all that intelligence back. For instance, we have one of our principal engineers in Sweden today uh, at the FSFE Legal Summit and his job is to work with the compliance industry and tooling and bring back that information. And then another senior PE is working on the security side, OpenSSF and others. And another PE is working on foundations and how do we track membership, what value we're getting. So we, and, and on the marketing side, they are also um, making sure that they are present and learning and bringing things back. Um, so we are trying to systematize how we bring information back and then how we react to it. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, sorry. There's one at the back and then um, Mary. Um, so you mentioned your OSPO sits at AWS, right? So what additional uh, action do you need to take to influence the open source strategy in other organizations outside of the AWS, like uh, the devices or store, like you mentioned? So. That's a great question. It's just, um, just from a reporting perspective, we sit in AWS, but it's very, very, very important. Our charter is Amazon-wide. Um, my boss, um, has a dotted line to both AWS and our stores SVP. And when we do business reviews, we do it with both sides. When we do our customer advisory boards, we're trying to make sure we uh, connect with both sides. And I'll, I'll admit that we need to do a better job of how we work with a very distributed group of stakeholders on the stores devices side because there's so many, many, many businesses. And so we need to do a better job there and, and understand their needs and support their needs. Uh, so that's one of the things we're working on this year. Yeah. Um, actually, uh, one more question, if you don't mind. Um, so you did mention, like, in, in terms to influencing the uh, business owners about the uh, open source uh, benefit, you want to have some more, like, hard numbers uh, uh, <laughs> and the benefits. But uh, in terms of a lot of uh, early stage of open source project, I mean, even though potentially you can see some long-term benefit, but it may not bring in immediate uh, ROI to the, to the business owners. So um, how do you balance this kind of a long-term investment versus near-term ROI they're looking for in, term, in order for them to invest? Yeah, it is a hard one, um, and a lot of projects you still don't know, um, you know, how successful they'll be or uh, where they'll end up going. But if we are, if we are taking a hard dependence upon that project and we're building a product or service on that, that becomes a huge motivator for us to make sure that that project continues to succe succeed and you know work with. So we have to take a faith that and invest to make that project successful. I, I don't know if I answered your question there. Um, but you have to have both emerging projects uh, that you want to invest in and existing projects that you need to sustain uh, in your impact. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And one last question, I think. We have time. 
Um, thank you very much for a very good presentation. Thank you. I learned a lot again. <laughs> Uh, I have one question about, um, for example, the license change issues like Redis, for example. Uh, maybe this is not very much related. I'm, I'm just wondering, people get this notification from different media or website. Is there any kind of a one standard place people can get noticed for all kind of license change open source project, which, which would be great? The second question, once you got the information, you need to spread this in your company. Um, if some teams, let's say, using the Redis, they probably need to report to Osborn. And how do you handle this in Amazon? Great question, because we just had to handle it recently. I wish there was a central place where we could go and check to see what license changes are happening or what uh, things are changing. Most of the time, it is uh, really either the company communicates to you a little ahead of time or publishes it online and says, hey, we are changing. And then you have to put the machine into action, right, to change things. Um, in terms of what we do, we try to uh, work with our infrastructure teams who track where software is used throughout the company. And we make an inventory of who's using it. And then we try to send out uh, communications to those teams uh, that this license has changed and what actions they need to take. Sometimes it is stay on the old open source license, not upgrade to the new BUSL or SSBL license. Sometimes it is work with your business line lawyers to make sure that you can get approval for using this new license. So it's, it's just making sure we can centrally track you know, where it's being used and, and communicate quickly to them on actions they need to take. Thank you so much, everyone. Really appreciate your time.